very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak on the Institute of Training and Research in Ayurveda Bill 2020. This is a bill that is both welcome and disappointing. That there is so much interest in our traditional healing system should not come as a surprise to anyone because it comes at a time of unparalleled popularity and mainstream acceptance of Ayurvedic practice, both domestically as well as internationally, as the minister has said. From the perspective of market conditions, in 2015, the global market for Ayurvedic products, according to our own government's figures, amounted to nearly $3.4 billion, a number that will nearly triple to $9.7 by the year 2022, growing at 16.2%. In a recent report, the forecast predicted were astonishing. The sale of Ayurvedic products is expected to rise threefold to $8 billion by 2022 from $2.5 billion in 2015. And at this time, an estimated 77% of Indian households are using Ayurvedic products. Now, the fact is, sir, the export also of such products from India, on average, is about $780 million a year and is expected to grow by 20% annually. And which state, sir, has been the engine of such remarkable growth and expansion in the field of Ayurveda? Kerala, Kerala of course. Well said, sir. Yes. The state harbors nearly 1,400 industries associated with Ayurveda, sir, which pull in a combined total of $37 million and exports of $8.6 million, in addition to an overall 10% market share of the total Indian market for herbal-based products and treatment. Now, as you all know, sir, the origins of Ayurveda can be traced back to the Vedas, starting from mentions in the Rig Veda and subsequently in the Atharva Veda. The term itself derives epistemologically from Ayur or life in Sanskrit and the Ved or science, and therefore it means the science of life. And there's a general consensus that the practices of Ayurveda were codified in three main texts, three main canons, the Charaka Samhita, the Sushuta Samhita and the Ashtanga Hridaya. In terms of its remarkable approach to treatment, there is arguably no equivalent of Ayurveda in Western medicine. As many experts have pointed out, unlike European biomedicine, which visualized and conceptualized the body in the form of dissections, Ayurveda looked at the body as a series of systems and where the balance of the key elements were a key to long life, healthy life and longevity. In fact, legend has it that the Ashtanga Hridayam, composed by the famous uh, practitioner Vagabhat, reached Kerala sometime around the 6th century BC, before, that is now 2,600 years ago, where it subsequently reached the Ashta Vaidyas, the legendary eight Vaidyar families, who with the help of Kerala's favorable climate and abundant presence of medicinal plants, were responsible for planting the seeds that today has made Ayurveda popular across the world. And Ayurveda sir, is also associated with Indian nationalism. During the colonial rule, the popularity of Ayurveda rose nationally, first because of the fact that the British did not, were indifferent to the health of Indians, leading to a very poor public health infrastructure and the outbreak of several epidemics like the Bombay Plague. And this meant that in traditional medicine was the only refuge of ordinary Indians, the only option, and so Ayurveda came back into popularity. And second, of course, because of the most um, politically charged revival of interest in our past that the nationalist movement evoked, and that led to renewed interest in Ayurveda. Of course, in the post-independence era, under many Congress governments and others, Ayurveda has revived, and along with yoga and the larger concepts of India's wellness, we have begun a soaring popularity for Ayurveda, which is particularly relevant today when the world is paying more attention to human wellness rather than merely the treatment of symptoms. And more and more people around the world are turning to Ayurveda as their preferred source of treatment. At the same time, in these conditions, there are factors that continue to pose challenges to our aim to realize the full potential of Ayurveda. The first of these is research and documentation, which of course I understand the bill seeks to address. I want to tell you, sir, sometime around June 2018, a paper was published by Dr. Syriac Abbey Phillips in the American Journal of Gastroenterology. He's a liver specialist, and he talked about how the consumption of an age-old Ayurvedic digestive, Dashamola Rishtam, had caused a severe damage to his 40-year-old patient's liver. Akin, he says, 
to what would have been comparable to an unhealthy and frequent consumption of alcohol. This article did a lot of damage to India abroad. Uh, many questioned the safety of Ayurvedic treatment. Uh, many Ayurvedic practitioners were not happy, but the fact is, whether you agree or disagree with Dr. Phillips, the incident nevertheless revealed a strong weakness of our Ayurvedic practice, and that has to do with credible documentation. Just the sheer speed of how much damage one article and one peer-reviewed medical journal of repute can do against a traditional practice that dates back 5,000 years is telling. <laughs> the lack of credible documentation as a concern may come across as a paradox to many because, of course, Ayurveda has been gaining in popularity. But what is interesting is in Western science, they say that for science you must have a clear diagnosis, clear prescription, the prescription resulting in such and such results, you document it, you show your research, and that's how the science is established. Ayurveda is much more instinctive, rather like the ragas, where the basic raga is laid down and the each player plays his own tune, improvising from it. Similarly with Ayurveda, the each individual Ayurvedic practitioner <coughs> will treat each patient differently. <coughs> now the result, <coughs> we had a situation where a British committee on science and technology in 2010, headed by the then president of the World Federation of Neurosciences, John Walton, declared in a special report that Ayurveda was a system without any scientific basis. In fact, they, this committee, in the value of complementary and alternative medicine theories, the committees ranked Ayurveda lower than even hypnosis or crystal therapy. It took official outrage from the UPA government at that time and presentations from a high-level delegation of Indian experts before that committee before the latter was forced to see the benefits of Ayurvedic treatment. And we even had defense experts from the Siachen experience going and saying that Ayurveda was the most effective treatment for high altitude sickness. So these are the kinds of things we need to do to be able to document effectively. In the absence of credible documentation, case studies on the proven benefits of the treatment of Ayurveda in specific cases, all it will take is one article, one paper, for the international community to dismiss Ayurveda as a voodoo science, something all of us here will agree it is not. Therefore, documentation must comply with international standards for reporting and evidence-based research, and that's very important when we decide what we're going to do in this bill and beyond on strengthening Ayurvedic treatment in our country. But serious documentation is only one side of the coin. The other important aspect that we don't adequately del deliberate over is that legal security and safeguards are not provided adequately to Ayurveda and indeed to all forms of traditional knowledge in our country. Now, see, every time when you make a malish with Ayurveda, I'm not sure if I'm giving you a relief, so if it's bad, if it's bad, if it's bad, then you may be healthy and कारी मिर्च दूध में उबाल के पिएंगे या मुलायटी मुलायटी बिल्कुल एक खांसी के लिए या पेट खराब है तो आप पुदीना ले लेंगे तो ये सब आप क्या कर रहे हैं यू आर रिलाइंग ऑन इंडिया के ट्रेडिशनल नॉलेज दैट्स द एंशन विज़्डम हैंडेड डाउन ओवर द सेंचुरीज इफ नॉट मिलेनिया हमारे माँ तो माँ से सीखे हैं एंड and diverse resources of knowledge, but we lack a comprehensive system to safeguard those who over the generations have protected and honed these resources, and that's putting us at a disadvantage in the globalized world. In fact, many of our indigenous communities rely on traditional knowledge for their livelihood, their identity, and its misappropriation can prejudice their interests and rights. Ayurveda, for instance, caters to nearly 65, 70% of our population in rural India. But nothing has been done to safeguard its practitioners and their store of knowledge. In an age where biopiracy is a very real threat, the safety of our traditional knowledge is not something we can defer, but it's been ignored in your bills, Mr. Minister. Contemporary scientific and technological advancements, when married to tradition, offer great promise. That's why other countries are trying to acquire exclusive privileges in the form of intellectual property rights over India's traditional knowledge. And that's with people with very vague connections to our knowledge. 
seeing common Indian herbs patented in America gave us all a major wake-up call a few years ago. So the intellectual property regime seeks to protect researchers and innovators, but it may do the opposite by privileging those who come up with creative new ways of copywriting traditional knowledge and exploiting the discoveries of the ancients. At its very core, the concept of intellectual property cannot be applied to traditional knowledge because no single person can claim as his property something that is perennial, evolving, and in its very nature, almost amorphous. As one of the world's oldest civilizations, with a wealth of accumulated traditional resources, it is our responsibility to do what is necessary to maintain the integrity of our cultural inheritance. And if we do not take steps now, misappropriation by others may well lead us to belated collective regret. That's why, Mr. Minister, a few years back, I introduced in Parliament a private member's bill for the protection of Indian traditional knowledge, which provided custodianship of all traditional knowledge to either the state or the central government, with such custodianship transferred to the practitioners who could show their practices as distinct and exclusive. They were also empowered to market their traditional knowledge as they deem appropriate, ensuring that any commercial value would benefit the traditional indigenous people of our country. By design, my bill was intended to protect us from foreign appropriation and would have provided an opportunity for Indians to learn more about their culture and practices through a legally protected system. Non-custodians could work with the original communities, communities who preserve it. You know, sir, we have the traditional uh, knowledge digital library, a database containing 34 million pages of formatted information on some 2,26,000 medicinal form formulations in multiple Indian languages. This is a major step in this direction. It has helped codify and classify our traditional knowledge so we had others can't grant flawed patents under their system. But unfortunately, my bill was not adopted by the government. It eventually lapsed. Uh, I do hope, sir, that the minister will reconsider incorporating in his holistic approach on Ayurveda a need for a traditional knowledge protection bill in our country. We cannot over overlook that while we're discussing Ayurveda. One more point, sir, before I turn to the specifics of the bill. <clears throat> in a globalizing world, it seems that there's a controversy about Ayurveda. Disruptive market forces have come in. There is a clash between the purists and the new age practitioners of what I once termed Ayurveda light. Now, what does that mean? There's no argument about the increasing popularity of Ayurveda. Clinics claiming to offer Ayurvedic treatments are sprouting like herbs in places as far afield as London and the Italian Dolomites. And Ayurvedic tourism is already a significant money earner for our national exchequer. We had a debate on tourism the other day, sir, and Ayurveda remains a major feature of it. We in Kerala have been advertising our, advertising our Ayurvedic spas, many five-star hotels in Kerala, which a few years ago would have looked down on anything so desi, have actually cashed it on the rage. But what are they selling? Tourist brochures often show a, a winsome blonde being massaged by a lady in a traditional red border white Kerala sari uh, with jasmine in her hair and a brass lamp at her side. And this is effectively packaged exotica. It's not Ayurveda as a remedy for disease, but rather as an upmarket beauty treatment, a relaxation cure for the jaded. A 5,000-year-old science has become the diversion of choice for the era of the 15-second soundbite. Now, purists have been questioning this. They say, this is not authentic Ayurveda. Ayurveda is a total system of medicine meant to treat the body and the mind as a whole, cannot be reduced to merely superficial treatment. And they reject this Ayurveda light as an abomination. And they're compelled towards the principles that originally inspired Ayurveda. And of course, uh, professional Ayurvedas also reject the Ayurvedic cosmetics industry and so on. Now, you can argue that's a good argument for creating strong teaching, training, research in Ayurveda. But let me also offer a slightly devil's advocate position. Sir, I've not even got to the bill, sir. I was given more time. Okay, sir. Sir, five, six minutes. Just said 14 minutes. Five, six minutes. Time allotted is only 18 minutes for you. For entire party. Entire party, I'm telling. Okay, sir. I will summarize. Two more speakers are there. You have to decide, na? Mr. Sasi you have to decide how many speakers are going to be speak in the bill. I will abbreviate. I will abbreviate. 
I will abbreviate. Sir. So the point is, my, my, I, I will summarize that entire argument to say that as a tourist draw, we should be prepared to compromise and we should be flexible in our approach to generating awareness of Ayurveda. And also, sir, we, we, have, been, uh, we have been discovering that investment in R&D is not enough. It's a fundamental driver on the deliberations of the future of Ayurveda. And this bill comes up short, sir. As a member of parliament for Thiruvananthapuram, I've continuously pushed the government, the present government, to establish a national institute of medicinal plants in the city so we can establish my city's and my state's traditional expertise on the subject, make the capital city the focal point of cutting edge research and development in this field. And sadly, despite repeated attempts, this proposal has found no takers with the central government. Similarly, sir, National Ayurveda University has failed to fructify. Both could have taken us very far, sir, in developing our knowledge and expertise in Ayurveda. But there is a dissonance between the government's purported claim to promote Ayurveda and the reality of its actions. This apathy would extend to other aspects of Ayurvedic education and training. Some of you will recall a report that between 20... Please, sir, three minutes, sir. Between 2016 and 2018, the Ayush Ministry allowed 138 understaffed and ill-equipped colleges to teach courses in Ayurveda, science and surgery at both the graduate and undergraduate level. This was in contravention of the recommendations of the Central Council of Indian Medicine, which had previously inspected please, these please colleges no. and found them unsuitable to train future practices, practitioners of Ayurveda, and that doesn't augur well. So I urge the ministry, sir, that we should avoid such self-made disasters. I also want to point out, sir, the bill fails to secure the larger objective please of promoting up Ayurveda. The please statement up. of... Sorry, sir? Wind up your speech now. I, I'm, I'm just giving please. the last three, four objections please. to the bill itself. I was giving the... I was told I had half an hour, sir. You're suddenly telling me after 13 minutes to cut down. No, no. See, in the, in the in business advisory committee meeting, your party leader must have told you that the that? time allotment allotted to the Congress party is only 17 minutes. I didn't hear that, sir. I was please. not told that. Please wind up this speech. Anyway, give me three minutes to quickly summarize what would have been 15 minutes. Please, 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 please. The statement of objects and reasons of the bill state that the conferment of the title to the University of uh, Institute of National Importance will be enough to attain self-sufficiency. But how can the government expect to cater to the demands of a country of 1.5 billion population and fill all the lacunae in our present system to the upgradation of one university? You can't promote the quality and excellence in education, research, and training, which is the objective of the bill, by avoiding institute of national importance to one institution, sir. This results in the failure to establish a nexus between the classification made and the object sought to be achieved by the bill. And unfortunately, sir, one of the first ever Ayurvedic colleges in the country, the government Ayurveda College, Thiruvananthapuram, set up in 1889, <coughs> a pioneer in this <coughs> has been ignored, even though it is much older than the Gujarat Ayurved University, sir. The fact is, it has not even been upgraded to a university, much less being considered for the Institute of National Importance status. And the point is, yes, sir, I think there is an amendment coming from my colleague, Mr. Premachandran, which I will support. But given the, the long history of Ayurveda and Kerala, which I'm sure my other colleagues will repeat, so I won't say it, there have been many, many arguments for taking the glorious traditions of Kerala Ayurveda into account in deciding what should be an institute of national importance. Sir, the minister came to my constituency, sir, in 2018 to inaugurate the new wing of an Ayurveda building, and he gave a public assurance on this question to upgrade please the come to your last point. Ayurveda College to come a to your last research point, university. And later in question hour on 29 November 2019, I reminded the minister, and he graciously reassured us in the House that the ministry is committed to considering this proposal but it still remains unfulfilled, and I look forward to hearing from the minister on this. The selective conferment of Institute of National Importance status says an issue that is even beyond this bill. No one has defined what is an Institute of National Importance. We are talking about strengthening Ayurveda by ele elevating this particular thing in, uh, in Jamnagar, sir. But the fact is, on what basis is it considered national importance? Isn't there arbitrariness in doing this? Where is the equality with the other institutions of Ayurveda in this country as provided for in the, in the, uh, in the Constitution? The Standing Committee on HRD had once said there should be parameters to evaluate the institutions. That has not been done. Is it merely because the initials of this university are GAU? Okay, so I'll just wrap up. Just to finish, sir, 
I want to conclude by saying I am a cautious optimist. I do believe the future is bright for Ayurveda. I had many other things your I members want to say. Will not get chance. Flaws of the bill, sir. But if you are taking more time, your member will be dropped. I just request, sir. I just request that. <coughs> sir, sir, we spent half this, an hour, this, this, sir, this, this, on the 377. I therefore request that what is being done for Gujarat also be done for Kerala, that we have a similar national university for training and research in Ayurveda set up in Tiruvananthapuram, as well as the, uh, and, uh, as an institute of national importance. So this concept has some meaning that standards are maintained, training and teaching is properly done, and research and documentation can be achieved across the country so that the credibility of Ayurveda around the world is protected. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.